In this video, the higher time frame technical trading strategy is revealed. Hi, I'm Mike Bellafiore, co-founder of SMB Capital, and we're a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm also the author of the trading classic, One Good Trade, and the playbook. In this video, a firm prop trader breaks down his real-time, higher time frame technical trading strategy with his live exits and entries. Let's get to work on sharing these important trading lessons so you can grow your trading account. This is a higher time frame breakout in NVIDIA. This is dating back to the 8th of February. Um, and the intraday pattern I use is what I call a pull-up pattern, which I'll go in depth about. Uh, but just kind of looking at where you can spot inflection points um, to capture some of these larger term trades and big picture ideas. So the trade criteria starting off, um, I'm solely looking at higher time frame breakouts uh, and stocks near important higher time frame technical levels. I need to see elevated R vol with all my trades. I want the price action to be clean. Tim, if I could just jump in. So of course. why are you only looking at higher time frame trades? And that is not an acquisition. That that is that is uh not to say that that is uh the wrong thing to do. I'm curious as to why you do that and the significance of that for your trading. Yeah, so starting off, um, kind of like tested a lot of different setups to see what I was good at and look at my stats and then boiled it down um, when I looked at my trader view stats uh, and the type of trades that were the most successful for me. Uh, it all stemmed back to these higher time frame ideas where um, I'll go in depth also about it in the next slide. And I want to jump in here and just make the point. So I actually did an interview with somebody who I really liked and I was really hoping would uh, jump to the top of the, the queue uh, or the leaderboard or the, the, the prospect board for those that we were uh, looking to hire. And this was a person who was coming in uh, as as an sort of in between, not not somebody new, not somebody fully experienced with a three year track record, somebody with about a year of a track record, and I was really pulling for this person, very likable person. Had known him actually in the past through uh, contacts with him from following SME training. We have two companies. Their main company is SME Capital, our prop firm. But we have our education company, SME Training, and had known him through there. And he had taken some of our training and now was taking that next step to apply to the firm after having success in trading markets. I actually think he made almost 600000 last year in net P&L, in trading P&L, and, and was interviewing to, to, to the firm and one of the things that, and I hope he reapplies after my feedback to him, but one of the things that caused us to pass for now on him was that he was not tagging and measuring his trades. And to me, the, the, what I see is going to happen with his trading uh, is that when the market changes, like it's done the last couple of weeks, he's really going to struggle. He's going to really draw down and he's not going to necessarily know why and he's going to draw down too much. And, you know, we're in the we're in the business of building really big traders. We're not here to build people who make $100,000 and there's nothing wrong with that. That's still a terrific living. It's just that's just not the business model we're in. We're into building seven-figure and eight-figure traders. That's the work that excites us. Um, and look, if you try as hard as you can and you know you only become a $600,000 a year trader or $800,000 a year trader, that, that's, you know, that's great. You're always gonna have a home for us. But if you're not doing all the things that you should be doing, like tagging your trades, understanding what your strengths are, then you can't get as big as you want to be. You're gonna draw down too much 
you're going to take trades you shouldn't be taking. You're going to frustrate yourself needlessly by not doing well in, in those trades that don't measure well for you. And you're not going to reach your potential. If you're going to do something, you might as well do it well. And so, you know, our, our culture here is, you know, you don't need to become a seven-figure trader. You don't need to become an eight-figure trader, but you need to become your best trader. We need to see that from you. And we need to see that every step along the way. So I love what you said, which is you have found your niche looking for certain types of trades and you have found your niche based on measurement, based on tagging and measuring your trades, based on your statistics. You didn't just sort of sit around talking with a, a bunch of buddies after the close and say, oh, you know what? I should trade longer term technical setups. No, you had proof to show why you should. Uh, super important. And so, and that is something that's going to differentiate the people who get invited to join our firm. And that's going to be something that is going to help you become your best trader. Sorry to jump in there, but I, I thought that anecdote uh, was spot on to what you actually just said with your own trading. No, yeah, that was perfect. And I will add to with the tagging your trades, it really was an ongoing process where having those stats help you see like maybe some problem areas. And then you have those stats to align with your personality where I didn't like first come to higher time frame breakouts the first time I looked at my stats, but it was like an ongoing process of just improving certain areas and then basically aligning that with what would work best for me. And then I would say it was about November, December, um, which is multiple months of just improving until I went to the higher time for breakouts. Um, but yeah, going um, forward with it, uh, as well, I wanted to see the stock showing relative strength within the sector. So not enough that just the sector showing relative strength, but the stock that I'm choosing, I want it to be one of the strongest um, for that day. And then a way I would get more risk on is if any one of those areas is showing exceptional strength. If you want to learn three more real world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing now at the top right hand corner of your screen. That will open up the free registration page in a new window. So don't worry, you won't lose this video. You can also visit tradingworkshop.com to register for this free intensive workshop. You're gonna learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. And then the entry criteria for this intraday pattern, um, the stock has to make a strong move off the open, which I'm measuring based on three fourths of ATR. And then it has to pull back to retest VWAP and then also retest the area that it broke out from. And then with this, I'm not looking to time the pullback to a bottom tick, but I'm really waiting to see how it reacts at VWAP. And if it gets below, I want to see it rebid, and I need to see that volume come in uh, when it does do that. And then I would be risking that pullback low. And if it just doesn't go below and it just holds VWAP, what I'm waiting for is evidence that it's holding volume coming in and it's supporting that level. And I'm giving this three tries, so important to risk accordingly. And then the only place I'll look to add is the first higher low after the bounce. Um, and then not looking to add anywhere else because the risk reward then becomes much less. And the reasons to sell. So with this strategy, I'm using a measured move off of that opening drive I talked about. And the way I'm going to be taking profits is small lot sizes, incrementally going into targets and then above my targets. And then the reasons to get flat uh, is if the stop hits. Um, so once this trade starts to work, I'll be moving my stop up to important pullback lows in places where it's holding higher. Um, and if the trade is going to work um, and I did my job, I should be in it for most of the day, if not the whole day. So a reason to get flat would be a weak close, um, which would tell me that I do not want to hold any of the position overnight. So question. One best practice 
that people follow or, or one trade decision that is worth consideration is whether or not you should be as big overnight as you were intraday. So if you are thinking of holding this trade uh, overnight, are you going to hold as much as you did intraday? Because overnight you can't control your risk as much. So that's number one, that's, that's A. And then B is if the stock isn't paying you well intraday, should you hold a lot overnight? Th those are two trade decisions that very successful traders at a minimum make and for you to think about for your system. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and for me personally, with this setup, uh, what I would look for at the most would be holding just a fourth overnight. Um, because the idea behind this intraday pattern is I'm looking for an outsized intraday move um, that could have momentum following through to the following days. Uh, but the idea is if it's an A plus trade for me and it's a trade that does work, um, it should have a very strong intraday move where I would be wanting to take profits intraday as well. So usually about a fourth. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on my overall like thought process, kind of going off of what we were talking about with the stats and just what led to these higher time frame breakouts. Um, and I do want to mention with SMB that we get paired with a mentor. Um, and mine has been significantly helpful with my overall trading and selectivity. And I've adopted some of his principles that he looks for in the way he thinks through trades. Um, and that's led to a lot of success and really helped in my selectivity and patience. But yeah, going uh, forward with it, what I'm looking for is the first like ch step in my process would be it has to be a higher time frame breakout, like we talked about. Um, so this one's a technical breakout. It also could be earnings, any other catalysts, hourly breakouts. But then once I have that, I am looking at those A plus variables, those tri trade criteria that I mentioned. Uh, and the most important ones for me are the clean price action, uh, just how it's trading on the tape, as well as Arbol. And then once I have the A plus variables, I have about six to seven intraday patterns I look for. So those are ways where I time the trade to get those good risk to reward opportunities. I'm able to control my risk and that's the way I identify these inflection points. And he's helped a ton with this and kind of this was his way he looked at it where if there wasn't a higher time frame breakout, then there's no reason to look for an inter intraday pattern. Uh, if you do have that breakout, but you don't have the A plus variables, then don't look for the intraday pattern. And then if you have the higher time frame breakout with your A plus variables, what you're doing is just sitting patiently and waiting to see if an intraday pattern aligns. And since you know these intra intraday patterns well, when it does align, you're able to capitalize uh, and put risk on. But that's kind of basically what I've adopted from him, which has been super helpful in the way I think through all my trades now. And then big picture, uh, we're coming out of the post GME, like kind of madness, I said, craziness, but we are still in a very speculative market, uh, which we've seen now has changed uh, end of March in April, but this is back in February. Um, and the market overall started the year pretty quiet, uh, kind of was grinding high with just low volume, and we have not had really any major catalysts to drive the market itself um, since early January. So looking at SPY, we're under the previous all-time high. Um, we just had a pullback in the previous week um, that held uh, and put in a swing low. And now we're just kind of grinding higher, like you can see, on a little lower volume. And then just looking at that on the hourly. So this was that pullback I'm talking about where we failed multiple times at 386, pulled back, some buyers stepped in 370. Um, and we really did not spend a lot of time below this 374 uh, level, which was important. And then following the pullback, we had a couple strong days. Um, and then following that, uh, we want to digest the move. And what's important there is that we did hold higher and we held above this 380 uh, level. And then I'm also wanting to look at the queues, uh, considering this is a trade in NVIDIA, so uh, tech semiconductor. So this is also sitting right below its all-time high. 
uh, the previous pullback um, held as well. And then it's a little clear to see on the hourly. So we failed at 330 a couple times, pulled back. Previous support level of 314, we had some buyers step in and this uh, held as the pullback low. And we had a little trouble at 3.30, um, again, at that same resistance level. But going into this trade, we're now above and holding above. So that previous resistance now becomes a support level, uh, which is a good sign for the trade. Looking at SMH, um, the semiconductor ETF as well, because it's NVIDIA, uh, very similar story. Um, and it's looking ready to make a move for a new all-time high, uh, holding higher. Um, after the pullback as well. And then this is just again, 234 is an important level for this stock as well, and we're holding above. And on the day of the trade um, in NVIDIA, we see that SMH also had a strong opening drive. So as I'm trading NVIDIA, I'm watching SMH to make sure on this pulling, it's holding VWAP at the same time that NVIDIA is pulling in. So I'm watching it um, basically every tick alongside NVIDIA. So for the intraday fundamentals, um, this is no specific uh, company specific catalyst, but it's a technical breakout catalyst. Uh, so with looking at that, it's important to rank the breakout uh, for how important it is and significant. Uh, and with NVIDIA, I would say it was a nine out of 10. Um, this wasn't a breakout to an all time high, uh, but this is a breakout on a tightening wedge consolidation on the daily chart. And given the length of this consolidation and the volume on the breakout, uh, I would give it a nine. Um, I do wanna mention overall with semiconductors, um, the backdrop has been very bullish for them. Uh, starting with the pandemic, there's been a global shortage in chips, uh, which has led to strength in the semiconductors. And then the ATR for NVIDIA is 20.95 uh, average volume, 7.1 million. At the time of the trade, uh, the RVOL was two, and this was not the RVOL right off the open, but when I entered, uh, institutional ownership 69%. So this is the consolidation I was talking about. So we started consolidating from last September, uh, and you can see it's tightening. Uh, which is what I want to see. And then when I do see, see this higher time frame chart, what I'm looking for is on these pullbacks to the bottom of the wedge, is there increasing volume when it holds? And with NVIDIA's case, you can see every time we tested, it had um, a lot of buyers step in. We had that volume supporting it. And then the last pullback held and the stock pushed higher to 550. That's a little bit unusual there. You, a textbook pattern usually is you want the volume to be light into the pull-in, but I think you're making a nice distinction there, which is, all right, well, if the volume is heavy and it holds, well, that's okay too. Uh, yeah, kind of. I'm also agreeing with that. So what I was um, referring to is when we do have this pullback, like I'm just going to look at this first one um, to like this area. I do look for like pretty low volume in comparison, but when it holds and we start to bounce, that's when I want to see that increase in volume. So like where I circled this first blue circle, this is this day and then the gap up the next day. So just a little bit of both, I would say. And then this is the hourly chart in NVIDIA. Um, so this is just showing the most recent pullback and depth a little bit more. Um, and we had 510, 515, some buyers stepped in uh, to defend these levels and we held. And now you can see we're just pushing higher and we were just consolidating um, the day prior to this. And another variable that I look for, um, it doesn't mean I wouldn't take the trade if it's not there, uh, but a slight gap up is a uh, good sign for me with this type of trade. And we get that going into the 8th of February. And it's also a good sign the day prior after a pretty strong move from 515. Uh, we had a couple days inside days to digest that move. Um, 
And without that, it makes it a lot harder for me to try to take a big picture idea like this, given where it's come from. But when we consolidate, um, it just says to me that there might be energy for another up move. I was just gonna show my entry. So we're looking at uh, NVIDIA right here, which is this smaller chart, unfortunately, but here's the tape to the right side. So what we're gonna be looking at is like this 560 area. So we break through 560 off the open. This was the breakout level. And now we're coming back to view up and I'm gonna watch to see how we react. Uh, and you're gonna see with this, uh, it takes two tries for me to enter. And um, you'll just watch the volume that comes in once it does. And you can tell right now, as we are pulling into VWAP here, a lot lower volume, which is what you wanna see compared to the open. And with my risk management, um, something I know I've talked about in my daily reviews that I sent to you, Mike, is the importance for me personally to make sure I am giving myself enough tries at the stock and not risking too much initially uh, where I wouldn't be able to put the size on if it takes a couple tries. All right, so right now we're below 562. I'm just going to be patient, just watching to see when we do react at uh, view up. I could even skip ahead a little. Okay, so we start to hold there. And at this point, I'm going to just wait to see if um, we're going to start to bounce a little bit and get above the previous uh, open of the minute candle, the five minute bar. You're going to see I'm going to enter in a second, risking that pullback low. And what I really want to see when we do start to bounce is that it's a clear bounce. We have the volume confirming that for me. And then with this first trade, which I'm going to cut um, very quickly, we failed at 563. But the most important thing to me, as this volume bar is developing, uh, we don't have volume support in the bounce yet. So it might take a little more time, um, and I take it off. And the idea behind this uh, pattern is that we broke through 560. And if we could hold VWAP here, we're holding VWAP as well as holding above the breakout level. And I'm in the rush uh, to enter. And the way I trade is I like to have it show me um, that it's ready to go. And for me to have that confirmation rather than trying to guess um, anywhere in here. So I just get in around yeah, 562. We start to see more volume coming in. Uh, I don't have it on the screen right here, but I have a uh, volume alert basically that tells me in real time how much volume's coming in on the current bar compared to the last 30, um, which you can kind of see on this left chart. And what I'm seeing right now is we're just kind of a little sticky in here where this 562 to 563 level, um, we've been just kind of trading between. So now we break above that and you can see the momentum hit the tape where we move like about 75 cents pretty fast. And right now I'm about to add to my position. So I doubled there still risking that pullback low. We're above 564. Yeah, that's a good ad there. Thank you, yeah. Definitely um, one thing I've 
continually worked on is just when I have that confirmation and I have the volume coming in, uh, adding there and not even thinking about taking profits yet. Yeah, um, you're getting more price and volume confirmation from your original position, which brings up a trade decision to add some more size. I think that's a good decision there. Yeah, definitely agree. Thank you. And then with this trade too, the idea is you're really trying to find this inflection point. And if it was going to consolidate here for 20, 30 minutes, that's not what I want. Where it should, if the trade is there and it is an A plus opportunity or like it looks like, it should move away from my entry price pretty fast. And then I just wanted to show that this ended up being a trade that I held the entire day. Um, I could kind of go to where I have tape. But we see made a new high a day and then had a natural pull in back to 565. Um, I took off a little bit of size um, on the new high a day. But this is about where I end the tape. And what I'm looking for the rest of the day, which I'll show in my trade management, is I'm not looking to add anymore, but every time we are getting these pull-ins, I'm just observing if we're holding higher levels. So here we're holding, we will be holding um, 565. So just putting in higher lows, and that's a confirmation of strength for me. Hey, Tim, if I can go back to something you said, which is super important, which is that you yeah. give this more than one try. Yeah. How do you go about deciding on your risk for trade one, trade two, for the amount of trades overall you're going to give this? Um, yeah. and, and how does, how, you know, how do you figure out if you're going to give it a couple of tries and obviously you're not going to put on the max risk on the first trade. Yeah, so, exactly. so how does that work for you? So the way I look at it, um, coming into the day, this was my top idea. So I want to say in the pre-market, what I'm willing to risk percent wise of my daily stop. Um, so if I'm willing to risk 25%, um, let's say of my daily stop, um, if I'm giving it three tries, I would probably want to do it about 5% each try, uh, which still allows me a couple spots when I have confirmation to add to get to full size. Um, this is something that I'm continually working on um, where there are some trades that take more tries. Um, what I'm thinking toward or thinking back to was the NFT names. Um, some of those were very difficult traders and even took six, seven, eight tries. Uh, but the idea behind it is I need to position myself where in the tries before it works, I can't be losing an amount that changes my psychology and mindset that would lead me to not put enough size on the real opportunity or not take it entirely. So I would say just before the open, a risk allocation for the symbol itself and on this trade idea, and then to divide it up with how many tries I think. And then, so when you start to see more of the confirmation based on price and volume. Yeah. How do you change your risk allocation then? Yeah, so um, like you saw on the tape, when we did get this bounce and we had that volume come in, uh, if that's like, basically I would then change it to, if it doesn't work here, it should work here if it is gonna work. So if it doesn't work here, then I'm done for the trade entirely. So at that point, um, that would that was my second try. And then I would be looking to get to full size on this position, on this position overall. So once I do have that confirmation, um, and part of that is like from watching this trade and other symbols, at the spots where it should work, if it doesn't work there, then there's something wrong with the idea. Maybe I'm too early. Um, maybe it's not there entirely. Um, but yeah, once it goes um, and gets above 563, 564, um, I'm getting to full size in my position. 
So if I lost 5% on the first try, I'm going to be getting into 20% of my daily stop overall. Then that leads into the trade management. So the first thing I'll mention with the opening drive that I look for, uh, the measured move was approximately 15 points. So I'm using that as my targets. So from the pullback low, I'm just using that measured move. So my target for this trade was 575. Um, and then I'm looking to hold a quarter of that original position overnight if we have a strong close. Uh, and the way that I look at a strong close is if we close in the top 20% of the intraday or of the day's range. If we close in the top 10%, it's even better. I want to see increasing volume going into the close. Um, and I'll be monitoring that in after hours as well, um, just to see up until 8 p.m. where we have the decision if we want to cut the trade. I want to just make sure we're not gapping down um, or anything crazy like that. But yeah, going into it, like you saw on the tape, um, my entry was on this pullback to view up, holding above 560, which is that pull-up pattern. Uh, it took two tries, um, and then I added above 563 when that volume came in. And then one way I could improve that I want to mention is I think it's okay to take off some size into the 566 area, 567. Um, this is a spot where I could fail from. So kind of with my system, I want to take off a little there um, just to cover a little risk. But when I do that, it shouldn't be the amount I did on this trade. So yeah, there's just a lot of ways I can improve. And this is one of them where I was out of about a fourth of my position into 570 um, when this was confirmation that it was working really. And then we pull back into 565. That's where I ended that tape. Um, this is a sign of strength to me. We pull in after making that new high. Um, and this is something to expect. And what's important is that we hold 565 and we hold higher and consolidate. And on that pull in, you can see once we hold and then we start getting back above um, this 567.50 level, the top of the consolidation, you can see extreme volume comes in. And at that point, I'm in the driver's seat. So what I'm really doing is just making sure I'm patient enough with my profit taking. So I'm going to sell 10% um, into or above 570 on a new high a day just taking some profits along the way, very small lot sizes, just uh, incrementally scattered. And then we go into 575. Uh, this was my target based on the measured move, and I'm gonna be taking off 40% there, 20% going into the target uh, layered out, and then 20% above 575. And once we get above the size of my shares that I'm selling is gonna start increasing. And then another sign of strength is on these pullbacks. Once we get to 575, we pull back and we hold above the previous high a day at 570. And then on the next pullback, we put in another higher low and we're continuing to hold uh, the 21 EMA on the five minute as well. Going into the close, uh, I sold 5% to get down to a fourth into 578 and 579. Um, just kind of into momentum uh, when we broke to new highs a day. And then I'm holding the rest, the holding the rest, uh, risking everything to 569. So below that 570 level. So this was a good learning lesson for me. Um, we didn't get a gap up on this day. And the trade I was looking for was uh, one to two day um, multi-day swing trade where I was playing the momentum of this breakout on day one. So what I was looking for was clear continuation. And if I can just jump in here, were you chatting, talking, communicating with anyone else who was in the trade or interested in the trade uh, while you were in this trade? Yeah, uh, I was talking to my mentor, uh, Garrett, throughout this, um, which was very helpful as well. Um, just for me at the moment too, don't have a long-term account. 
So I was just kind of going through my thought process on the way I was managing and game planning to manage the overnight um, position. So just going over with him was very helpful too and just sticking to that game plan. So we didn't get the gap up. Um, so what I'm looking at is I want to have continuation. So right off the opening drive, um, I sell 25% into 580, which was my first target on the rest of this position. And then the other targets I had was 585 and then 589. Um, and I was stopping below that 570 level, like I mentioned. So once we fail at 583 and we start to come down, SMH was weak as well. I'm not trying to force anything um, based on the time frame of my trade. So I lighten up 25% um, below 572. Um, we just broke below the opening price. And then I got flat below 570. So just stuck to my plan um, and stopped out. And it's important for me personally to just be disciplined with this. And remember, I just made a great trade, stopped out of it, and then move on. Like, don't dwell on anything that happened. So you can see these are my executions for it. Um, it looks like a lot of executions based on those small lot sizes that I mentioned. So some aspects to think about um, for my review. Um, I'll actually go back to this for the first one is the important aspect of making sure your timeframes are consistent throughout the trade. So with this idea, there's many ways you could have traded it where you could have just traded the momentum right after we held VWAP. Some people could have got in on the opening drive. You also could have played for a longer term swing trade um, where you were looking to hold until we broke to a new all-time high. And in that scenario, you would want to be risking to low of day. You probably didn't take any sales this day at all. And then on the day two, you'd be looking to buy any dips. So maybe you bought 572, 570. Uh, but that wasn't what I was looking for. Um, so it's just important for me that all the trade decisions that I make are aligned with the time frame that I'm trading. Where the part I mentioned where I was taking off some size at 568. That's a little too short term um, minded for the trade that I was going for. And that's an area to improve. And then some other areas, um, we mentioned this, but risk management on the entry attempts. So just making sure that I'm able to stick with the trade because an A plus trade could take multiple tries. And then the difference between trusting a trade and letting it work versus being flexible. So when I'm trading, one of the questions I'm asking myself throughout the trade is, am I being flexible enough? Am I watching the tape and being aware of places to lighten up? But that also is a fine line between making sure I'm trusting the trade. It's an A plus trade. I have the intraday pattern and really letting it work for me and being patient and not taking sales. And then the last thing I'll mention, um, at the time in February, this was my biggest trade to date. Um, and one thing that just stands out to me as a big takeaway is there was many ways I could have traded it even better. So just always keeping that mindset. Well, that's great. I mean, you're playing to your strengths there, right? Yeah, definitely. And you're playing to your strengths that you have proven are your strengths. Yeah, with those stats like we talked about. That's good. Uh, and then we'll leave it here. I, I do think I'd love to talk a little bit more about the importance of not just joining a team, but joining the right team and joining with team members who are like minded to what your strengths are and the type of trading you're doing. We, we passed on yeah. that during uh, the discussion before, but we'll get back to that at some point. I appreciate it, Tim. Congrats yeah, on the. Congrats on the, the biggest trade and many more to come. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comments section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB, train and trade well.